Well, tonight we are in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. A lot of uh, folks have found it enjoyable to go to the church app and look up media down there, and then you'll see 2 Timothy 4, 1 tonight, and you can click on that for the notes and follow right along, because I do have other thoughts and verses that I don't bring up in the message. But for you guys who also just want to sit there and look at me, um, we'll, have the, we'll have this stuff up on the screen as well. So we're trying to get it every possible way. And so, Lord, open your word to us now to behold wondrous things in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. Let's not lose focus that this is Paul's last letter. He is the guy who has authored uh, more than half of the New Testament. Uh, what a vessel of God he has been. He has been under arrest for uh, many years. He was released for a short time, then rearrested and taken to Rome while he is waiting for uh, Nero, Caesar, to make it back into town or uh, get to him in the line of the judgments of, that he's making over his vast kingdom. But it ends up being years, often it wouldn't be uncommon for somebody to die first before they had have a chance to see Caesar. Um, however, Paul would, and as we know, he'd be put to death. We're going to hear some famous words in this chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. I fought the fight. I finished the race. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. Judgment day is coming for Paul. He's going to be standing in a throne room, and there will be a judge. Now, in Rome, sometimes the Caesar would be the judge of the Olympics, and he would then be upon a throne called the Bema seat. But other times he was the judge, a ruler of condemnation, sentencing people to death. And Paul is, it's pretty radical to think that in a few days, I'm going to be standing before the awful throne, the awesome throne, and there find out what this judge says about me. Well, Paul doesn't want Timothy to lose that focus, that we will all be standing before the judgment seat of God. And... Um, and that's a fearful and awesome, wonderful thing. And so in chapter 4, he's going to give him some list of things that he has let go to the side that he needs to pick up and do them as work. He may not feel called to it. He may not feel grace for it. He may not be find it enjoyable. But he's being commanded here to do it anyway. And he says in verse 1, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So I charge you. This is a clear military word. You know, the general don't come out and say, hey, guys, I'm thinking about us all going for a 20-mile hike tomorrow. What do you think? With your backpacks. No, not the, no, not the backpacks? Okay. Um, what, do you, what do you think? Okay, 15 miles. Is that what's going to happen? <laughs> He's going to bark out the order, and it's going to probably seem harder than they would like, right? I mean, that's just sort of the way it works. Just as you're getting comfortable, pack everything up, you're getting shipped off to somewhere else. And this is what he's saying. God is giving you commands through me as your general and uh, all I want to hear is, sir, yes, sir. Okay, that's it. Yes, Lord, I will obey. Remember, Jesus stopped the multitudes at one time where they were chanting out, Lord, Lord. He said, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I say? If I were really your Lord, you don't have to say it. I'll see it by the fact that you are responding to me as your Lord. And here, in essence, he is saying, Timothy, there's some areas that need to be straightened up. The military captain's coming into the barracks, and everybody, everything better be in its right order. 
And so he makes it clear that God the Father and the Son, the chief and the commander-in-chief, are going to be there, not Nero, not Caesar, not some man with some warped sense of justice, but God, who is a God, yes, of love, yes, of mercy, but of justice. Do we understand that? God, God couldn't exist. Love couldn't exist. Excuse me. Love couldn't exist without perfect justice. Because if you don't have people judged, then there can be no love or mercy. Let me give you a quick illustration. You might have heard me share this before. But let's say your wife, daughter, mother, whatever, got kidnapped, brutally beaten, and eventually they found her dead. And they finally found this guy, maybe a serial killer, and they're bringing him into court. And it's been a few years, and they finally have gotten around. The justice has finally, the gears have ran, and there you are in court. And the prosecutor begins to get up and to say, well, let me tell you about this guy. He has murdered, he has raped, he has tortured, he has... And the judge there says, stop just a minute. I, as a judge, am only about one thing, and that's love and mercy and kindness. That's the only thing you need to know about me. So, Mr. Prosecutor, I don't need to hear. Sir, in the name of love, go free. And this murderer, the serial killer, gets up and walks out and starts wandering the streets. And there is the family of this victim. And they're horrified, right? And they say to that judge, you're not loving us. <laughs> you're not being merciful or kind to us. Do, do we understand? Without judgment, without justice, there can be no love or mercy. And in the name of love and mercy, if there isn't justice, it's evil. So understand when the Lord says, I've got to judge every word, even idle words spoken. They're all going to come to light. Everything that's in the darkness is going to come to light. Not half of everything, not 90% of everything, but everything, one person by one person, even though there's billions of people, it's irrelevant to God. But one by one, every word spoken, every meditation of your heart, things you didn't say, but you thought. And all our deeds are going to have to be presented before the Lord. And of course, the Father will be there, but he is not the final judge. In John 5, verse 22, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And then in John 5, 26 and 27. For as the Father has life in himself, he has also granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. And so all the judgment has been given unto Jesus, not in this case the Son of God, which is also a correct title of him, but he said, because he's the son of man. He himself has lived in human flesh. And as we've talked about previously, Jesus for eternity is going to remain like us. As a, a human, we're going to be humans in heavenly suits, <laughs> heavenly bodies. Jesus remains human, but yet he is God. We're humans with a finite spirit in a heavenly suit. Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who was in a human suit, but his human suit was resurrected, and now we shall all be exactly like him. And the flip side of that, he shall always be like us. The Bible says we'll see the scars still in his flesh, resurrected flesh, but similar enough uh, to human form that there still would be those scars that remain. And so, Jesus, the Son of Man, 
is going to have all judgment in his hand. And he talks to Timothy about a moment when you were going to be out of this body, present with the Lord, and there all things are going to be known and revealed. He calls it the appearing before the kingdom. We know about that. When the Lord returns, those who have already died are with the Lord, but not in their glorified bodies yet. But they who have already passed on and are with the Lord will get their bodies in a split second before us. But all of us who are alive and remain will be raptured, caught up, all of us in our brand new bodies. And then we return to earth for that thousand year millennial kingdom. And, uh, and he says, understanding that in a moment, and even if we live another hundred years, it's going to seem like a second, isn't it? That we are going to have to give account to God all that we've done in our body. In 2 Corinthians 5, I really want to get to verse 9 and 10, but before we get there, I've got to read the verses 1 through 8 to make sure you understand he's talking to believers. And he says in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made of hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with the habitation which is from heaven. Amen. Groan every day. Uh, If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. And mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us a spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, talking to believers here, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Clearly talking about believers, there's only hope, right? There's only joy, confidence, faith that, that all the condemnation is gone and we are born again of his spirit. His spirit is living in us as a down payment, a guarantee of our eternal life. But that's not what Paul's getting to. What he's getting to is what he's saying in verse 9, 10, and 11. Now look there in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9 through 11. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present in our human flesh on earth or absent in our heavenly body, our heavenly body with the Lord, so will be well-pleasing to him. Now listen to verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And I want to make a note here that this word is bima, the one where they would stand before the Olympics. But nevertheless, in describing this judgment, He says that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So even as Christians, we do things that are bad, that God is going to take an account on that day of judgment. What's Paul's response to this? It's a sobering sense of awe. Notice what he says in verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, the awesomeness of God, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, the sense of standing before God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to evaluate every word we spoke, everything we've done, good or bad. He says, therefore, we persuade men, but we are well known to God and also trust are well known in your conscience. You know that we live that way. Myself and Silas and Timothy and all the guys with us, we come to you and we walk as Christians. We are as weak as you. We want to sin as much as you do. We don't want to get up and bunch of non-Christians and tell them they need to repent and get to Christ and, and through Jesus and his cross to receive eternal life. We don't want to pack it up and go to another town after we just got beat with rods in one town and we got stoned in the other one and now we're heading off to the nether one, which we'll probably get robbed and beaten or shipwrecked again. But he's, he's saying, I, I have to, I know that, yes, there's no condemnation in Christ. Yes, I'm, I'm secure in my salvation. But I am also 
very much in my conscience on a daily basis that all the words I said today, all the things I did today, the imagination of my heart today, that on this day, February, what are we in? 26? Huh? 20th? On February 20th, 2019, the Lord's going to flip that page and he's going to have a talk about it. And man, there's some months that I'm going to dread. <laughs> I know I have some really bad report cards, you know? But there's other seasons of my life I'm going to be going, woohoo, this is fun. But Paul says there is this, this awesome thing that just covers me up like a wave of that day of appearing before the Father and the Son who has scars in his head and on his hands and on his feet in perfect holiness with the seraphim and the seraphim flying around saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And therefore, it affects how we live on a daily basis. So there are two different seats of judgment. The one we mentioned, the Bema seat. The other one I want to talk about, which does not apply to us as Christians, but to non-Christians, is the great white throne of judgment. And I think we need to read this to, again, realize why we share our faith. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's why we need to get unstuck with the idea of evangelism and discipleship, right? You... Want to be my disciple? Yes. Okay, be my disciple. Now, here, here's the first command. Go into all the world and make some more disciples, right? Teaching them to obey me. Well, in Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small, great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. That's our book. But there is still another book. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Then going on in chapter 21 of Revelation, those first eight verses, and now I saw the new heaven and the new earth and the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God was with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Verse 6 now. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the foundation of water, the fountain of waters of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But on the other hand, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It always astounds me that on that list, they're in the order they are. The two things that are most offensive to God is cowards, and secondly, is unbelievers. And then, of course, you've got abominable murder and, and so forth. So that judgment seat of the condemnation of those who simply didn't believe, and that's why they lived an abominable, sexually immoral idolatrous life. But then right in the midst of it, he intertwines them both. As the Christians read 
Revelation 20 and 21. They're like, oh, this is wonderful. The tree of life, the fountain of water. Oh, they, and then, oh, the, ju- the, the judgment of the wicked. They, they, it's not like there's one chapter on one and one chapter on the next. He interweaves it continually. I think to give us that sense of joy and then that sense of disaster. That sense of joy in our salvation and the great sorrow. Those who didn't believe and maybe they didn't hear to believe. We're going to talk about this in detail next week. But we say in heaven, after the tribulation is over, the millennial reign has come in, the millennial reign is in. And now we're standing before God at the judgment. We realize that all mankind is also standing before God for judgment. And we see what it means, the lake of fire, the place where they're going to weep and gnashing of teeth, the place designed for the devil and all the demons. But yet people that were our neighbors that we worked next to, that maybe we only met for two minutes, but that was plenty. That's all God needed was two minutes for you to be a light, a salt, a witness. And there they are. It's interesting. We, we see a couple of pictures where they're, they're not horrible people going to hell. Remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And Lazarus was poor, but he was righteous, and he went to the booths of Abraham. The rich man into Hades, and it was a place like the dripping of acid. He said, Father Abraham, I can see you past the chasm. Could you please let Lazarus, I know that guy, he sort of owes me. He used to eat my garbage. I don't know what this guy's thinking, but hey, can he put his little pinky in some water and dip it on my tongue? And he said, no, not at all. And this man didn't curse or yell or spit. He said, well, forget about me. I have five brothers that are in the same state that I am that will all end in this place as well. We don't see a hatefulness in him. We don't see a demonicness in him. We actually see that this man still has love for his brothers who are heading to the same Hades he was going, that he was in. And so he's telling Timothy, you understand there's a day of judgment for you. And you're going to have to give an account for all the things you said, but let's make it clear. Also, the things we didn't say when we should have. All the things that we did, but all the things that God had predestined beforehand that we should have walked in them and didn't. And then there's a judgment for the wicked. Simultaneously, I want you to realize, and we're going to see at the very end here in these first five verses, he basically tells him, He needs to do the work of an evangelist to fulfill his ministry. That understand, by you not fulfilling your ministry, there are people that are going to be cast into that lake of fire. And that thought should overwhelm you. Well, there's more about this Bema seed of Christ I want to talk about. Paul says it this way in Romans 14, verse 7 through 12. None of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For we who live, we live to the Lord. And we who die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt to your brother? Then Paul says this doctrine again to the Romans as he did to the Corinthians. For we shall all stand before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. For as written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to me. Catch this last sentence in verse 12. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. When people were not judging themselves correctly, and they were giving themselves a pass on some of their sins, while at the same time, condemning other Christians for their sins, Paul really parses this out in Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. 
Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. From whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same in a different way, a different form, but it's identical to God, that you will escape the judgment of God? Verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of, and his goodness and his forbearance and his long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who, verse 6, will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Interesting, his definition here, isn't it? He says there that there is a group of people that are going to eternal life, but as I look at them, they are ready for that day. By patient continuance, they're pushing through, plugging through. They're conscious of doing good works, seeking that day when I stand before the Bema Seat of Christ, and I have sacrificed. I have given my body as a living sacrifice. I have looked at my vessel to keep it in sanctification and honor, sanctified, set apart for the master's use. Why? Because I know that day is going to be here. It's going to be here in a second. Man, I can remember my high school graduation. I just remember pinching myself like, is this a dream? And then my college graduation a week later, getting married, then the first baby, <laughs> then the second. And, and, and I mean, it's just like, it just is a thing that, it, did it all take one second or did it really take 50 years? And now all my kids are in their 30s. It's, it's shocking. I remember people used to tell me, oh, all my kids are in their 30s. Like, wow, you are really old. <laughs> but we know it. We know this, don't we? I mean, we're, we're going to be standing in line, <laughs> bumping each other, going, Brian just preached on this, said it'll seem like a second. It was 30 years ago, but man, it's just, just like you said, it's a second. And he goes on to say in verse 8 of Romans 2, but those who are self-seeking do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also for the Greek. But he comes back, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to do to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Listen to this final statement. For there is no partiality with God. It's clear to God. It's, it's, not, it's not like uh, a little powwow. Trinity, let's get together here. Father, Spirit, uh, this is a tough one. What do you think? It's clear to him. And you know what? To those who are called to be God's sheep, it's clear to them. They're hearing God's voice. They're obeying him. They're thinking every day, I'm seeking first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. There, there is just a sense that the Lord could come any moment. There's a sense that if, if this person doesn't come to Christ, who I've come to love, who, who works next to me for the last 10 years, doesn't come to heaven. It's, it's going to be horrendous. I, I know for myself with my kids, my kids not going to heaven, <laughs> I, I would be in a place of torment. I'm thankful that all three of my kids are following the Lord, but it hasn't always been that way. And I'll tell you, I was sorrowful, even in the midst of great successes in my own life. Just the thought that they are not walking in obedience. I know they're still claiming to be Christian, but they're not walking in obedience. And, and, and if the Lord were to come today, it's a scary thing. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, people say, hey, Brian, can you do this funeral for my grandpa or my dad or whatever? It's like, yeah, I know you. I don't know them. You know, tell me about them. 
And of course, the question is going to come up, were they a Christian? Oh, yeah, you know, we were flipping through a box of books and I found a, you know, vacation Bible school thing when they were seven years old that said, yes, I received the Lord. Well, anything after seven years old? Well, no, I mean, not, no. But they're hoping for the best. I, I don't want to put my family in that place. People I love, I don't want them to be scratching their heads going, well, we're hoping, you know, somehow he slid through there. No, Peter talks about how we should add to our faith a diligence, and that diligence would lead to this life of surrender and sacrifice and obedience that there would be an abundant entry into the everlasting kingdom. So Paul, on this subject, he he. When you put them all together, it looks like this. In Hebrews 9.27, For it's appointed for every man to die once. But after that, judgment. He just wants to make it clear. And, and you know, you're, I, I say it every New Year's Eve as I look across the room, even with this number of people. There's somebody here that won't make it to next year. So this isn't like, oh, put this away for when I'm 80 years old. I can start thinking about it between 80 and 92 when I die. That's foolish, isn't it? I know I said it the year my son died on January 20th. He was only 21 years old. I mean, there should be a chill up our spine when we realize death could come any day. And then after that, there's no <laughs> fixing anything. It's like, man, these last two years are really crummy. Let me go back, you know, let me go back to live another couple of years and straighten it up and then, then let me die a second time. It's, it's not that way. I mean, it, when we die, it's gonna be the most in, inconvenient time, right? And for a lot of us, it, it, we, it didn't see it coming. We had no idea that this was the final sermon we'd hear on Wednesday night. We had no idea that we would never see another year on this planet. So he's he's trying to sober us up. He's trying to sober the Christians up that he was speaking to that were wanting to go back to Judaism rather than to walk by faith in the work of Jesus. And again, I I, want to make it clear in Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Chuck Smith always says, I'm 100% confident in my salvation when I'm walking in the Spirit. (laughs) And then I'm about 80, 90% sure when I'm not walking in the Spirit. But, you know, I know a lot of doctrine and a lot of good sermons out there I can, you know, to embolden my heart to believe, even though I'm living in disobedience, that I still will make it. But he goes, I'm just not confident. I I just find myself, you know, five-point Calvinist, once saved, always saved when I'm walking in the Spirit. And then I have a hard time convincing myself of that fact when I'm walking in the flesh. In Ephesians 6, he says to the bondservants, you're slaves, it's a horrible situation. Of course, everybody in the Romans... Society was a slave if you weren't a Roman. But he said, just don't, don't let it affect you. Just this master who's, who's not really a good guy, just work for him as if you're working unto Jesus, knowing that you're good. He says in chapter 6, verse 8, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. So do it in your you're a mailman, do it as unto the Lord. If you're digging ditches, do it as unto the Lord, whatever we do. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 and 12, he says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood or hay or straw. But then he goes on to say in verse 13 to 15, Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. 
If anyone's work is burdened, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. So he gives us a real insight here that there are Christians that are clearly born again, but yet they have layers of their house <laughs> that are going to be burned with fire, and that whole year was a waste as far as heavenly reward. And he said there are some people, they're going to have zero reward in heaven. Just the fact that they're saved, that's it. And Jesus said clearly in Matthew 6, you want to store up treasure in heaven. Why? I don't know. But there's a different quality to heaven for the one who is stored up in heaven. Then in chapter 4, he says this in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 5. He said, let a man so consider us as douloses. We're the lowliest of servants of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. We're just lowly servants preaching the word. More of it's required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know that nothing, I, I know of nothing against myself yet. I'm not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. He will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart that each one prays will come from God. So they were judging Paul that he was wanting to lord it over them or he was trying to make money off of them or all the various things they said in First and Second Corinthians were very rude and wanting to just disconnect with Paul altogether because they got Apollos or Cephas or somebody else they wanted to follow more and uh, just wanting to just write Paul off. And, and Paul says, you're making judgments about me, and I don't, it's only one judgment I'm worried about, and that's before the Lord. And I don't know of anything, that doesn't leave me off the hook, because God's going to look at a very deep part of my heart that I can't even see. He's going to look at what I'm doing and the motives of why I'm doing it. You know, some guy's driving down the road, and he sees a pretty girl with a flat, and he's like, oh, well, man, I'm a good Samaritan. Two days later, he drives by and he sees some, you know, ugly pot-bellied fat guy. And he's like, yeah, I wish I could stop, but I'm such in a big hurry. You know, we don't know all what's going on in our hearts, right? But God does. Well, in chapter 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why we do not look at the things that are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we see as Paul goes into 2 Corinthians 5, where we talked about the body and, and therefore knowing that we must all give an account, good or bad, what we've done to the Lord talking to believers, there's this sense of awe that that is actually going to happen. Now, before I go on, just a few more verses here. I, I find that this teaching, this doctrine, doesn't go as clear to Christians in various churches that I've taught at um, and they're sort of bewildered going, I've never quite heard this before. And it's right here in the scripture, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's really not a, a debate on it. You know, as far as the condemnation, God's taken that and it's forgotten, he says, buried in the deepest sea. But yet, for reward or lack of it, there's a sense of tension. This is why the Lord said the rapture could be any day or any hour. Paul thought it could be in his lifetime, as we read in 1 Corinthians 7. Why? Because we need that tension. You know, the, the guitar, you don't just tighten it as much as you want. You got to tune it exactly to that very, very specific place, right? But yet the tension on that one string is horrendous. And so, yes, we, we have faith and confidence that God's going to forgive us. His grace is going to abound. 
And, and if we sin, he's our faithful and high, wonderful high priest that's going to give us all the grace and mercy we need. And yes, that's true. That's one separate pillar. But there's this other pillar that says, you are made in my image. Understand, you have a perfect free will. As much as God has a free will. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? that we can choose to just violate every moral known to man and sin our heads off, even after being born again. Our flesh is still there. Our choice is still there. Or we can choose to deny ourselves, take up that cross, give our bodies a living holy sacrifice, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and we realize that unless that is a focus... <laughs> unless you start your day in prayer and meditation in the word and crying out to God to give you grace to overcome your weak flesh, it's not going to happen. And Paul is saying, me and my guys, it happens when we're with you. You see it. And, and how is it you see it? It's because we have this overwhelming sense that man isn't getting it right. You might judge my motives wrong. I don't think they're wrong, but you could be right. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's irrelevant because I, everything I'm doing to live is Christ, right? To die is gain. And you say, well, why isn't this a message that we, we hear on a regular basis? And it, it's because it's, it's putting the burden on you a bit, isn't it? It's saying you're responsible. And, you know, like the Catholic Church just says, get your last rites, doesn't matter what you did, you're covered. Whew, that's good. As long as I'm a Catholic, I'm good. <laughs> they took the pressure off me. And in essence, these sermons sort of put the pressure back on you. Tighten up two ends of the string. One pillar where my sin abounds, his grace abounds more. And on this other over here, I'm going to reap what I've sown that I'm going to have to give an account of everything I said and didn't say, everything I did and I didn't do, and even down to the very meditations of my heart. The persecuted church, they don't have to worry about this. <laughs> if you're in an underground church in Russia or China like it used to be, or nowadays in the Muslim world, believe me, <laughs> every day you are very conscious that I better live for Christ or this is really stupid because I'm gonna, these guys are going to kill me. I mean, it just didn't make sense, right? It just sort of shaves away all that carnalness when I literally don't know if I'm going to die today by the Muslim police for, being, for having a Bible in my house. So if I'm out sinning and stuff, it's like it, it, it would just make zero sense. But in our Western culture, we have to remind ourselves that Yes, we can live quite comfortably, lukewarm. We can live quite comfortably, not living holy as we know God is holy. James says in, in James 1.12, he says that when a man endures temptation, God takes notice of that, and he is going to give him a crown of life for that. Isn't that radical? You're fighting this temptation going, should I just give it to my flesh or is it worth it? And God is saying, trust me, on that day of judgment, when I come to that place to say, you have fought temptation and have overcome, and there is a prize for that, a crown of life. In Matthew 12, 36, again, Jesus said, every idle word that we speak, we'll give an account of it on the day of judgment in Matthew 12, 36. In Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. In Matthew 18, 4, therefore, whether hum therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child, is this little child over here crying, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In Revelation 2, 7, he says, if we overcome, we'll eat of the tree, that he will give us a tree of life in which we can eat from in the paradise of God. Hey, I know you, you got a crown. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> hey, is that your tree? Yeah, that's my tree. 
I get to eat of it all I want, right there in the middle of the paradise of God. You say, well, what's, what do these things mean? I don't know. You know, Paul said, I, I can't even begin to talk about it. John was commanded by God to talk about it, but he sort of leaves us wondering, going, wow, a tree, that doesn't seem like a great reward, but this is a tree of life, and it is a great reward. In Revelation 2.10, again, he says, those who are faithful until death will have a crown of life. In Revelation 2.17, who overcomes will eat of the hidden manna. Isn't that radical? There's a special manna food for certain people. And then he said, I will give him a white stone. And on that stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So again, right now it said, okay, I get a stone, I get a tree, I get a crown of life. Um, I get a special name written on it, just only me and Jesus know. And, and so on earth, we don't really have things to equal this to, do we? But when we get there and we see him and know all things, even as we are known, he says, you're going to want some of that manna. You're going to want to be the guy with the tree and a white stone. And then he says in Revelation 2, 23, I will, he says, I'm going to judge people in the church that are living an immoral life. And then he says, and then those who are not, I will give to each one according to your works. In Revelation 3, 5, he who overcomes will be clothed in white garments. And I will confess his name before my father and before his holy angels. So at the graduation ceremony, <laughs> There are people that are going to have this special proclamation. And the Father and all the host of heaven will have that summa, summa cum laude. How do you say that? Summa cum laude, summa cum laude uh, reward. And uh, you'll be distinguished. And it'll be a thing you want. And then in Revelation 3.12, he who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. It's interesting that David said, man, I, I, I wish I was just a bird with a little nest so I never would have to leave the temple. I could just stay there. And here the Lord is saying, there are people that are just going to want to live and worship and be with Jesus in the temple of heaven. And that they are. They're going to be like a pillar in that place. And they can stay there permanently if they want. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from, from my God, and I will write on him my new name. So he makes it clear, I'm going to write on him a name of God. I'm going to give him a new name. I'm going to write on him um, in particular about heaven. Um, there's going to just be uh, serious tattoos, if you would. I don't know what they are but it's going to distinguish the glory and the joy we have for eternity. Revelation 3.21, he who overcomes will sit with me on my father's throne. That's radical. People in the pillar in the house of God, other people sitting there with Jesus upon his throne. In Revelation 22.12, behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works. We're now at the very end, last chapter of the Bible. And Jesus is saying, Christians, that day may be hard for you to imagine. It may be hard in the midst of all the busyness of your life to, to think about. You know, you can't say to a five-year-old kid, well, Eat your vegetables, and when you're 16, I'll help get you a car. It's just not going to motivate them, right? they got to be mature. And, and the less mature they are, the quicker you got to give the reward, right? If you eat all your vegetables, you can have a dish of ice cream. When? Immediately after. You know, if you, you can't say tomorrow. That didn't, tomorrow doesn't mean anything to them. But as we mature... We say at 20 years old, I need to start putting money into the retirement account so when I'm 60, I have some money. That's a hard thing for people at their 20s to, to, to get it, that, hey, you'll be 60 tomorrow. <laughs> but maturity gets it. A little bit of money put away now, a lot of money later. 
And it's, it's hard to give up that little bit of money right now because I need it. But I just have to put it away where I can't see it or use it for some far, far decades and decades away, which I can't even imagine being 60. Right? But that, that's maturity, and it's hard to do. And, and so in the same way as believers, he's saying, guys, final word here. Get it. It's going to happen quickly. It's not going to seem like a long ways away when you're standing before me on that day. And my joy is to give you as much as I can. Let me have that joy. Well, finishing up here in, first, or in 2 Timothy 4, 1, going back again. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, hopefully this means a lot more to you now, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. We're going to look at this next week, but in verse 2, preach the word, explanation point. <laughs> Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort, all long suffering and teaching for the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, here's the command. I charge you, I command you, be watchful in all things. Jesus said that about the end of the last days, didn't he? Endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. Well, Lord, we come before you right now, and we ask that you would help hide these things in our hearts that we don't sin against you. We ask right now that your word tonight would be a lamp unto our feet. There's some that are being tempted, and they're not thinking about the, that day. They're not thinking about the reward or the lack of it. They're letting their lust, their greed, their anger, their bitterness, whatever it is, make it so this day, that's the only one day we counts right now. That's all we have to worry about is one day at a time. Be to the praise, the glory, the honor, and at the coming of your kingdom. Lord, I ask today that none of us, Lord, give us grace that you would hide this in our heart that none of us would shrink, shrink away in shame at your appearing. That none of us would be scarcely saved as many who are righteous will be. That we would live in a diligent way that your spirit of grace and mercy and kindness and help us to not be overcome with evil. Lord, help us to have all the fruit of the Spirit, the joy, the peace, the patience, that self-control that we can walk properly today as in the light, soberly, righteously. That if you come today, this moment, that there's a joyful, abundant entry. The Father with a big smile, all the angels with a big smile, and there you can give us right away all the reward, the white robe, the crown of life, our special name that just you and me know, all the things that are so rich and are going to be so necessary for a fulfilling eternity to the degree that you want us to have. We ask now that you would give all of us a mature mind. From this day moving forward, we can't make up for tomorrow. Forgive us, cleanse us, heal us, wash us, purify us. Lord, grace, 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 in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you all.